Chapter 9. There was little rain that summer. In the calm of the evening Nagasaki was sultry like a steam bath. When dusk came, the reflected light from the bay made one feel the heat even more terribly. Ox-drawn carts moved into the city from outside with their loads of straw sacks, and the wheels glittered as they sent up clouds of white dust. Wherever one went, the air was heavy with the stench of fertilizer. Now it is the middle of summer. The lanterns are hanging from the eaves of the houses as well as from those of the big trading houses where they bear images of flowers, birds and insects. Though not yet evening the playful children are gathered together singing their song. A lantern, bye bye bye. If you throw a stone at it, your hand withers away. A lantern, bye bye bye. If you throw a stone at it, your hand withers away. Leaning against the window he sang the song to himself. He did not understand the meaning of what the children were chanting, but it somehow held a sad and plaintive note. Whether this stemmed from the song itself or from the heart of the person who sang he could not tell. In the house opposite, a woman with long dresses flowing down her back was arranging peaches and jujubes and beans on a shelf. This was the shelf for the spirits of the dead, and it was one of the ceremonies that the Japanese performed to console the spirits who were supposed to return to their homes on the fifteenth day. To him it was no longer a rare sight. He had a vague remembrance of looking it up in the Dutch dictionary given him by Ferreira, and the translation he found there was, Hetstefest. The children played, forming a row and staring at him as he leaned against the window. Apostate Paul. Apostate Paul. They kept shouting. Some of them even threw stones in through the window. Naughty children. It was the woman with long hair who spoke, turning to scold the children and chasing them away. With a sad smile he watched them run away. He thought of the Feast of All Souls in Lisbon, reflecting on its resemblance to the Bon Festival, that feast when the windows of the houses in Lisbon displayed lighted candles. His house was in Sotura Marchi on one of the many narrow slopes of Nagasaki. Without permission from the magistrate's office, he could not go out. His only consolation was to lean against the window and watch the people going to and fro. In the morning, women with boxes of vegetables on their heads would pass by to the town from Omura and Esahir. At noon, men wearing only a loincloth, singing in loud voices and leading lean horses with burdens on their backs, would pass by. In the evening, bonzes ringing their bells would pass down the slope. He would stare at this scenery of Japan, drinking in every detail as though later he were to describe it all in detail to someone back at home in his own country. But then the thought would rise in his mind that never again would he see his native land, and a bitter smile of resignation would pass over his sunken cheeks. On such occasions, feelings of desperation would rise up in his breast as he reflected on the whole thing. Whether the missionaries in Macau and Goa had heard about his apostasy he did not know. But from the Dutch merchants who were allowed to enter the country at Dejima he gathered that news had probably reached them. This meant that he had been expelled from the mission. And not only was he expelled from the mission, he was deprived of all his rights as a priest, and perhaps he was regarded as a renegade by the missionaries. What matter about all this? It is not they who judge my heart but only our Lord, he would murmur shaking his head and biting his lips. Yet there were times during the night when this vision would suddenly rise up before his eyes and the harrowing thought would sear through his soul. Then, all unconsciously, he would cry out and jump up from his bed. The Inquisition, just like the last judgment in the apocalypse, was pursuing him vividly and realistically. What do you understand? You superiors in Macau, you in Europe. He wanted to stand face to face with them in the darkness and speak in his own defense. You live a carefree life in tranquility and security. In a place where there is no storm and no torture, it is there that you carry on your apostolate. There you are esteemed as great ministers of God. You send out soldiers into the raging turmoil of the battlefield. But generals who warm themselves by the fire in a tent should not reproach the soldiers that are taken prisoner. But no, this is only my self-justification. I'm deceiving myself. The priest shook his head weakly. Why even now am I attempting this ugly self-defense? I fell. But, Lord, 
you alone know that I did not renounce my faith. The clergy will ask themselves why I fell. Was it because the torture of the pit was unendurable? Yes. I could not endure the moaning of those peasants suspended in the pit. As Ferreira spoke to me his tempting words, I thought that if I apostatized those miserable peasants would be saved. Yes, that was it. And yet, in the last analysis, I wonder if all this talk about love is not, after all, just an excuse to justify my own weakness. I acknowledge this. I am not concealing my weakness. I wonder if there is any difference between Kikijiro and myself. And yet, rather than this I know that my lord is different from the god that is preached in the churches. The remembrance of that Fumi, a burning image, remained behind his eyelids. The interpreter had placed before his feet a wooden plaque. On it was a copper plate on which a Japanese craftsman had engraved that man's face. Yet the face was different from that on which the priest had gazed so often in Portugal, in Rome, in Goa and in Macau. It was not a Christ whose face was filled with majesty and glory, neither was it a face made beautiful by endurance of pain, nor was it a face filled with the strength of a will that has repelled temptation. The face of the man who then lay at his feet was sunken and utterly exhausted. Many Japanese had already trodden on it, so that the wood surrounding the plaque was black with the print of their toes. And the face itself was concave, worn down with the constant dreading. It was this concave face that had looked at the priest in sorrow. In sorrow it had gazed up at him as the eyes spoke appealingly. Trample. Trample. It is to be trampled on by you that I am here. Every day he was taken out for inspection by the Otona or some leading personage. The Otona was the representative of the town. Every month he came with a change of clothes and then brought him to the magistrate's office. There were other times, too, when through the Otona he was summoned by the officials and again brought along to the magistrate's office. Here he would be shown certain objects on which the officials were unable to pass judgment and it was his job to state whether or not they were Christian. The foreigners who came from Macau had all sorts of strange goods in their possession, and only Ferreira or himself could immediately judge whether or not they belonged to the category of forbidden Christian objects. When his work was done, he would receive some cakes or money from the magistrate's office by way of recompense. Whenever he went to the magistrate's office at Harkata, the same old interpreter and the officials were there, always greeting him with courtesy. There was never any question of humiliating him or treating him as a criminal. On the contrary, the interpreter carried on as though he had absolutely no recollection of what had happened in the past. And as for himself, he simply smiled as though nothing had happened. Yet from the very instant he set foot in the place, he was aware of a searing pain that told him of a memory that neither of them could touch but must always be avoided. This was especially so when he passed through the antechamber, because from here he could see the dark corridor some distance away from the courtyard. It was there on that white morning that he had stumbled along in the embrace of Ferreira, and so in embarrassed haste, he would turn his eyes away. As for Ferreira, it was forbidden to meet him freely. He knew that Ferreira was living in Teramachi, close to Seishoji, but they were not allowed to exchange visits. The only time they met was when they came to the magistrate's office in the escort of the Odona. Ferreira, like himself, was thus escorted. Both of them wore the clothes they had received at the magistrate's office. They simply greeted one another in their strange Japanese so that the Odona might know what they were saying. At the magistrate's office he made a pretense of the utmost candor, but it was impossible to express in words his feelings toward Ferreira. Indeed, there was in his heart a complexity of emotions, such as reign in the hearts of two confronting men. Both of them felt hatred and contempt for one another. Yet for his part, if he hated Ferreira this was not because the man had led him to his fall, for this he felt no hatred and resentment but because in Ferreira he could find his own deep wound just as it was. It was unbearable for him to see his own ugly face in the mirror that was Ferreira. Ferreira sitting in front of him, clad in the same Japanese clothes, using the same Japanese language, and like himself expelled from the church. Ha! 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 
Fairy Ru would cry out with his servile, laughing voice as he faced the officials. Has the Dutch firm come to Edo? Last month when I was in Dejima they were saying that they would. He would stare silently at Fairy Ru, taking in the sunken eyes and the drooping shoulders, listening to the raucous voice. The sun had fallen on those shoulders. At Seishoji, when first they met, the rays of the sun had beaten down on those shoulders. His feelings for Fairy Ru were not only of contempt and hatred, there was also a sense of pity, a common feeling of self-pity of two men who shared the same fate. Yes, they were just like two ugly twins, he suddenly reflected as once he looked at Fairy Ra's back. They hated one another's ugliness, they despised one another, but that's what they were to inseparable twins. When the work of the magistrate's office was over, it was usually evening. The bats flitted across between the gateway and the trees. They flitted over the purple sky. The Otona would wink knowingly at one another and depart to left and to right with these foreigners who had been entrusted to their care. As he walked away, he would furtively look back at Ferreira. Ferreira, too, would cast a glance back at him. Until next month they would not meet again. And when they did meet, neither would be able to plumb the depths of the other.